Hi everyone, today I will be talking on birth brachial plexus palsy and I'll try to keep it simple. Myself Dr. Prince, a consultant plastic surgeon from Shishuddha Institute of Plastic Surgery, Allied Mission Hospital, Thrissur. So first of all, anatomy of brachial plexus. It originates from five roots namely C5, C6, C7 and C8 and gives off three trunks, six divisions, three cords and multiple branches of which five major nerves supply the upper limb. Incidence 0.5 to 1.9% per thousand live births. So most commonly seen on the right side. Etiology. Shoulder dystocia is considered to be the most common cause. Anything precipitating this thing can increase the risk of brachial plexus palsy, like a vacuum or forceps assisted delivery, gestational diabetes, older maternal age, increased birth weight, large for gestational age babies. As such, 10 to 30 percentage of cases has no predisposing factors. So a stretch tear, compression or avulsion of the nerves usually after a forceful lateral deviation of the head during delivery is a cause for this one. Types of nerve injuries can be of three types. First one, neuropraxia, a stretch or traction injury in which the nerve structure will be intact but the myelin sheath will be damaged causing a disruption in the neuronal transmission. Usually, these kind of injuries recover spontaneously within one to three months. And second is an avulsion injury. The root of the nerve will be avulsed out from its origin and usually recovery won't happen in these cases and it's a bit more complicated. Third one is a rupture. The nerve will be cut and while trying to heal, it can form something known as neuroma which is a ball-like structure formed by the fibrous nerves. There will be some continuity in the nerve fibers but it won't be adequate to create the correct movements. Hence, false signaling happens means if a child decides to have an elbow flexion, the signals formed in the brain may be false directed to some other joint and may cause a false movement like shoulder movement. The main issue with neuroma is that it won't improve further and the parents will believe that the false signal happening is actual improvement in function which is actually not and this hampers the parents decision making on actual treatment proceedings. Another way nerve injuries can be divided or cl like classified is a preganglionic and postganglionic lesions. So the preganglionic lesions or types in which the root will be avulsed out and no intact root will be present. Hence they has got a poor outcome compared to the other one. And next is a postganglionic injury in which there will be a rupture of the nerves with intact roots and comparatively these are better ones. Next one classification. So mainly there are of three types. One is an upper plexus injury involving C5, C6 roots also commonly known as herbs palsy. Another variant of this one is an extended herbs palsy involving three roots that is a C5, C6 and C7 root also. So these two types account for 90 percentage of birth brachial plexus palsy. Next one is a pan plexus injury involving all roots. Third one is a clump case which is a rare one and involving C8 and T1 roots. Next come to the clinical presentation. The most common presentation is a waiter's tip deformity with shoulders in adduction, internal rotation, elbow extended and pronated position. So this is the most common presentation as herbs palsy is the 90% presentation. In pan plexus palsy there will be a flayed limb and in clump case there will be an absent grasp reflex of the hand. In case of root avulsion these findings are also seen in addition which include the first one is a Horner syndrome, second one is a hemidiaphragm elevation which is seen in x-ray and it's due to the phrenic nerve involvement which arises from the roots, third one is a rhomboid and serratus muscle palsy. So the presence of these three findings in the child suggests a higher lesion or a preganglionic lesion and has got a poor outcome. So how to approach this case? In our department, we mainly rely on the clinical examination finding to decide on the outcome and the need for surgery. Routinely, we don't do an electrodiagnostic study or an MRI in children. As we found that they are not much correlating with our operative findings. And when do you intervene? So we make this decision when the child is three month old. We look for a specific movement that is anti-gravity elbow flexion. Child should be able to flex the elbow against gravity. If he could do that, you can wait. If he can't do that, then proceed with surgical exploration. 
Various interventions are there for brachial plexus injury, which include a Botox, nerve grafts, nerve transfers, contracture release, muscle tendon transfers. Among these, nerve surgeries give the best possible result, but it has a problem. That is, it should be done within the time duration. So why is this three month timing so important in nerve surgeries? So we are waiting for three months so that if there is any scope of spontaneous recovery, it will happen during this time. So why can't you wait beyond these three months? There is something known as motor neuron end plates present on the target organs like muscles. Nerve impulse make the muscle act through these end plates. So these end plates will get damaged after 12 to 18 months of denervation or the nerve injury. So even if you do a good surgical repair after this and the nerve signals reach here, it won't work. And so can you wait for like uh, one year for the surgery? This is also not possible because like you repair an electric wire and the electricity reaches the bulb instantly, these won't happen in nerves. From the point of repair, the nerve should regrow to the target organ, that's the muscle, that too at the rate of one millimeter per day. So considering a child's limb is like 20 centimeter, which is like 200 millimeter, it takes 200 days considering this growth rate of one millimeter per day to reach fingers. And again, for the first one month after the surgery, the nerves won't grow since it's in the healing phase. And we are repairing it only after three months of waiting. So that time also has to be accounted or included, which makes it around one year for the repair nerve to reach to the fingers from the shoulder of the break, like where the brachial plexus is repaired. So if there is any delay in this repair, the nerve growth won't occur up to the desired point leading to a deficit. So that's why the three month timing is so important. Even if you lose a week, it can have a very bad prognostic implication of the child's prognosis. So this is an intraoperative surgical video in which uh, you can see uh, that a ball kind of thing is in neuroma. So we have to remove this neuroma and we have to uh, connect the remaining part of the nerves. So this is a child with pan plexus palsy or total palsy. And this is her post-op videos after uh, three or four years. And she's able to move her shoulders. Then she's able to flex her elbows. And she's again able to uh, drink a cup of water like after surgery. So there's another child. You can see the preoperative. Like she's having that herb palsy. And uh, we have operated her at the age of uh, nine months. And now you can see the post op like she's able to move her shoulders then like able to external rotate her shoulders so we have a lot of similar results like this to show and for optimizing recovery uh, we do physiotherapy in cases but the thing is physiotherapy is done to maintain a supple joint but it does not makes the nerves grow splints like night splints we used to give initially but these days we are not giving the problem with this one is that uh, the parents accept that it solves everything and it discourages the child from using the limb and the sensory feedback is very much important at this age for the child. And one of the major challenge we face these days is that to convey the parents on the need for surgery like at this age of like three months the, it will be very difficult for the parents to accept for the a need for a surgery so what we used to do is that like we uh, collect uh, a videos a testimonial from the parents like who already undergone the surgery and uh, this like helps us a lot in conveying the parents but still like it's a bit difficult kind of thing to convey the parents uh, this is another girl like who we have operated like at the age of four months now she's around seven year old and like she's improved like, quite a lot and she's able to do most of things this is another girl like now she's in eighth standard and this is one of the first cases we operated in our department so the takeaway message from our side is spontaneous recovery does occur in a significant proportion of babies maybe in like 60 to 70 percent but it's not the norm three months decide whether to operate or not and clinical findings are the most important predictors specifically this one anti-gravity elbow flexion at three months and physiotherapy maintains the joint supple but it does not make the nerves grow hope you find the information useful and thank you all from team shushruta